good to be with you, church. My name is Halim Sa. I serve as one of the pastors and elders here at The Stone. Last week, we started our fall vision series called This Matters, This Matters. As Matt talked about last week, the usual and the normal thing that happens here at The Stone is that we preach through books of the Bible. Um, we're going through the book of Exodus, if you remember. But once a semester or so, we pause and do a series on a topic like we're doing now that we believe will be really beneficial and is needed for our church. And so we're in the second week of a five-week series called This Matters. Essentially what we're doing is looking at why we do some of the things that we do here at The Stone. Why do we value God's word so much? And how do we go about preaching here at The Stone is what Matt shared with us last week. And in the weeks to come, we're going to be talking about the two ordinances that Jesus gave to his church, which are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism and the Lord's Supper, what is it? Why is it so important? How do we practice it here at the Austin Stone? We're going to be talking about the importance of being a covenant member to a local church body and what it looks like to be a member or a partner here with us at the Austin Stone. That's all in the weeks to come, but today we're going to be talking about worship. We're going to be talking about worship. Now, what's the thing that comes to mind when you think about worship? What's the thing that comes to mind when you think about worship? Well, something like what we just did, right? Gathering together and singing to God together. And so we are going to be talking about singing. But if you've been a Christian, if you've been a believer for a length of time, you know that worship isn't just about singing. You know it's not just about singing. What's it all about? What's worship all about? It's about everything. It's about everything. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 tells us, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do all to the glory of God for his worship. What God is saying is that everything is an opportunity to worship him. This series is called This Matters. We're talking about the things that really matter to us as God's people, as God's church, but what we're saying is when it comes to worship, everything matters. Everything matters. In anything and everything that we do, we are either worshiping God or we're worshiping something else. There is no middle ground. In anything and everything that we do, we're doing to the glory of something. And what God is saying is do it for God's glory, for his worship. What this is saying is that we're never engaged in a neutral act. Think about that. You guys are never engaged in a neutral act. You're always worshiping something. As Pastor John Piper says, we are to be a people that drink orange juice for the glory of God. That drink orange juice for the glory of God. We eat pizza for the glory of God. Amen? <laughs> Have you ever stopped and thought about how amazing pizza is? How amazing this thing called pizza is. Well, how do you eat pizza for the glory of God? You, you sit in front of this amazing thing called pizza. And you think to yourself, God, when you created the heavens and the earth, when you created the cows, when you created the pigs, when you created the grains and this wonderful thing called carbs, you created it for 10,000 reasons, of course, but I know at least one reason you created all those things is so that, so that I could eat this pizza. Right? Think about that. God had you eating pizza in mind when he created the heavens and the earth. That's an amazing thing. That's how you eat pizza for the glory of God. Of course, we cross oceans to be missionaries for the glory of God. But moms, are you changing your baby's diaper for the glory of God? God, I make a mess of my life too. Messiness in the crevices of my life. You get in there and you clean it all. College students, are you going to class for the glory of God? God didn't get much glory from me when I was in college. Are you going to class for the glory of God? Are you studying for the glory of God? Singles, are you dating for the glory of God? Are you not dating for the glory of God? Men, did you watch college football all day yesterday for the glory of God? Did, did God even enter your mind? Were you even conscious of him? Whether you eat or drink, it says. What is eating or drinking? Eating or drinking is the very basics of life, right? Whether you're engaged in the very basics of life or what? Or whatever you do, it says. You fill in the blank. Nothing is outside of that whatever. We are to do whatever. 
everything that we do for God's glory in order to worship him. So in a way, worship is about everything. Individually, as God's people, every day in whatever we do, we're called to do it for God's glory. But if you look at God's word, there's also a call for us to worship him corporately. Worship him corporately, to worship him by gathering together as God's people like this as a local church body. Just like what we're doing now. And that's what I want us to mainly look at for the rest of our time. Why do we gather like this together at the Austin Stone? Why do we sing together? Why do we listen to a sermon together? Why do we sing together again and call it a worship service? Why do we do what we do? We're going to be looking at Psalm chapter 95 today. I read Tim Keller's sermon on this text, and in it he said that this is quite possibly the best single place in all of the scriptures to go to to see what worship is all about. And I would tend to agree. I'll read it for us, and then after I read it, we're going to be asking three questions. Number one, what is worship? Number two, how do we worship? And number three, why should we worship God? Okay, Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depth of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands form the dry ground. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. We'll stop there. What we see from Psalm 95 is that worship is something that engages the entire man. Worship is something that engages the whole person. Verses 1 and 2, what does it show us? Verses 1 and 2 shows us that we are to worship joyfully. So then worship is something that engages our emotions. It tells us to sing and make a joyful noise. It tells, tells us to come into God's presence with thanksgiving, to make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. And so worship engages our emotions. But it's not just emotions. It's not worship just because we got together and sang some songs and, and had some emotional experience. Look at verses 3 through 5. Why should we make a joyful noise? Why should we sing and give thanks? Where does it all start? Oh, come let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Why? Why? For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. What are verses 3 through 5 doing? They're telling us true things about God, who he is, and what he's done. It's teaching us theology. It's engaging our minds. Verse 3 is telling us that our God is a great God, a great king above all gods, that there's therefore no one like him in all the universe. There's none his equal, and that no one can challenge or thwart his will. Verse 4 is telling us both the depths of the earth and the mountains belong to him. It's telling us that everything belongs to him. Not only that, but that it's in his hand. It's telling us that the things that seem so deep, the things that seem so grand to us, to him are little. He's in control. They fit in his hand. Verse 5 is telling us that God made the seas and the dry land, that every good and perfect gift comes from him. Verses 3 through 5 is teaching us theology. What is the psalmist doing? Tim Keller says about these verses that the psalmist is thinking, reckoning, weighing, calculating, counting, treasuring the excellencies of God until there's an explosion of emotion that leads to life change. Worship is something that not only engages our emotions, but it engages our minds, our minds. And so worship engages our emotions, but they're not just shallow emotions, right? They're not just shallow emotions that are too easily shaken. We seem to feel something strong in here, but we, when we go out there, we too easily lose it. It's too easily shaken. They're not supposed to be shallow emotions that are conjured up out of thin air by some 
songs that sound good. They're supposed to be deep emotions that's deeply rooted in theology, something that's rooted in the truth of who God is and what he's done. But worship doesn't stop there. Worship engages our emotions, our minds, and it engages our will, our will. Look at verses six through eight. Verse six says, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. It's calling us to bow down and kneel. Verse seven says that he is our God and we are his people. What does that mean? He is our God and we are his people. What that means is that we belong to him. You, Christian, you've been bought with a price. You no longer belong to yourselves. We belong to him. And therefore, verse 8 tells us, since he is our God, since we belong to him, there has to be a determination that today, if you would hear his voice, that you would listen and that you would obey, that you would not harden your heart against him. Worship engages our will, not just our minds, not just our hearts, but our hands. It's not worship until we kneel and submit and obey. It's not enough just to know God. It's not enough just to love God. It's not worship until we obey God. Do you see why all three are so necessary and critical in worship? When asked, when asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Mark chapter 12, he said, you shall love the Lord your God. It's just another way of saying worship. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That we are to love God, worship God with our every faculty, right? And so you may be able to sit down with a list of truths from the Bible. You may be able to sit down with a list of truths from the Bible. That God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything good, including us, including man. But that man sinned against God by not trusting his goodness, not trusting God's plan, not trusting his provision, and therefore death entered into the world. Therefore, we are deserving of God's eternal wrath. But God... But God provided a way for the salvation of his people by sending his son Jesus, that Jesus lived a perfect life of obedience that you and I could never live, and that he went to the cross, and at the cross, he traded places with us. That at the cross, he himself received the eternal wrath of God that you and I deserved, and we were credited the perfect life of obedience that he lived. But that he didn't stay dead, but that on the third day, he rose again from the dead, conquering sin and death and now sits at God's right hand and is promising to return again for his people. You may be able to sit down and read some of the truths of God's word and think with your mind, check, I believe that. Check, I believe that. I believe that, right? But if your inner being is not ravished by the sense of the beauty, if you don't feel your heart in your throat and you don't know whether to break down and start crying or start shouting and rejoicing, if you give mere intellectual assent to the truths of the scriptures, but if there's nothing in you that feels any of it, that's not real worship. You're not yet worshiping. Maybe you're saying, you know, I'm just not a real emotional person. But it's not true. It's just not true. You may not get emotional about God, but you get emotional about something, right? Maybe watching college football yesterday. I was jumping up and down, screaming at the TV, trying to get the Aggies to win. <laughs> Maybe somebody knocks on your door and they say, hey, you won a million dollars. Here it is in cash. And you say, oh, thank you. Close the door, open the door. I'm sorry, I would get more excited, but I'm just not an emotional person. No, we all get emotional about the things that we really care and treasure. And so you may not get emotional about God, but perhaps it's because you do not care. You do not treasure the way you think you do. And so if you don't feel anything towards God, who he is and what he's done, at worst, you're not a Christian. At worst, you're not a believer, and I hope I hope there's people in your life that love you enough to tell you that. You know, you say you believe in these things, but I don't ever see you loving it. I don't ever see you treasuring those truths. I don't see obedience flowing out of your life. Perhaps, perhaps you're not a believer. At best, perhaps you're missing out on some of the greatest treasures that God is giving you, privileges of being God's child. On the other hand, 
If you're here and the music is so good and you're bobbing your head and you're raising your hands and you're singing at the top of your lungs and you're weeping and you're laughing and having such an emotional experience, but if there is no bowing down, if there's no kneeling, as if to say, God, if you would speak today, I will listen. God, whatever you tell me to do, I will do. If after all the emotional singing, if there is no fundamental change in the way that you live, if there's no change in character, if there's no repenting from sins, if, if it doesn't lead to the pursuit of personal holiness in your life through the obedience of God's word, then that's not real worship either. You're not yet worshiping God. You had an emotional experience, right, that you really enjoyed. But God looks at it and he says, take those noisy songs away from me. It's not worship. So what is worship? Worship is something that demands all of you. Your mind, your emotions, and your will. The theology of your mind. The theology of your mind. The emotions of your heart. And the obedience of your hands. It demands all of it. Perhaps you've heard it called head, heart, and hands at the Austin Stone. Head, heart, and hands. The next question, so how do we worship? Or more specifically, how do we worship corporately here at the Austin Stone? How do we worship corporately? First, it's like just what I said. We worship corporately. We don't just privately worship God. We gather together, right? Privately worshiping God is important. But we gather together in order to worship him. Look at verses 1 and 2 again. Oh, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. As if to say, I've tried just worshiping him, worshiping God by myself, right? And he's worthy of more than just the worship I can bring. So come, come. He's deserving of more worship than this. More worship than I can give him by myself. Oh, come let us worship him. He doesn't say, oh, let me come worship. He says, oh, let us come worship. Everything is us language. So we're called to worship God, yes. But it's not just that. We're called to worship God together, together. Why is our gathering together so important? Why can't worship just be a private matter? Have we ever said that? Have we ever heard somebody say that? You know, I worship God, but it's just a very personal thing to me. Why do we have to worship God corporately and not just privately? I think the reasons are innumerable. You know, the last time Matt um, preached on this topic, the title was, Why Do We Sing Together as a Church? We were in Ephesians chapter 5 and it talked about how we are to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God, but also to each other, right? To God, but to also each other. That when we gather together like this, not all of us, if not most of us, are ready to just jump in and start worshiping. We've had tough weeks. Crazy things have happened. People are sick. We're worried. There's anxiousness. But then when we stand and our brothers and sisters are singing truths of God, to God, but also over us, right? We start being reminded. They start reminding us, oh yeah, God is great. Oh yeah, God is in control. Oh yeah, God does love me. He does care for me, right? So they encourage us and they draw us into worshiping God. The reasons are innumerable for why God calls us to worship him corporately. But I'll share another reason. We need to worship God together because we get more of God when we're together than when we are alone. We worship together because we get more of God, not less. C.S. Lewis in one of his books describes a great friendship he shared with J.R.R. Tolkien, whom he called Ronald and another friend named Charles. Okay? He wrote that after Charles died, he thought that would mean he would get Ronald all to himself. And therefore get more of Ronald. But in reality, he found that not to be the case, he explains. In each of my friends, there is something that only some other friend can fully bring out. By myself, I am not large enough to call the whole man into activity. I want other lights than my own to show all his facets. Now that Charles is dead, I shall never again see Ronald's reaction to a specifically Caroline joke. 
far from having more of Ronald, having him to myself, now that Charles is away, I have less of Ronald. Do you see what he's saying? What he's saying is that there's things about you only certain people can bring out. Isn't that true? There's some facet of who you are that only certain people can bring out. There are things about your friend that you can't bring out, but some other friend can. And therefore, if you really, really want to get to know somebody, not just one facet of who they are, but if you really want to get to know all of who they are, you have to do it within a community. This is the reason why if you want to get to know a certain so-and-so, certain guy, certain girl, you can't do it just by going on one-on-one -on -one dates with them. You have to see how they are with their friends. You have to see how they are with your friends. You have to do it within a community. And so if this is the case with a finite person, with finite facets, how much more true is it with an infinite God? We have this romantic notion that the best relationship that we can have with God is when it's just me and God, right? When it's just me and God. That gathering together like this and worshiping together, it's a good thing. But if you really want to get serious about knowing God, if you really want to get serious about worshiping God, then you have to get away for some me and God time. And me and God time is good. Me and God time is needed. But don't you see, this is exactly what Adam had exactly what Adam had. It was just he and God. All he had was just me and God time. But after observing all of his creation and seeing that it was good, the first and only thing in all of creation that God points to and says this is not good is Adam being alone. For many reasons, I'm sure. But one of the major reasons is because he was saying, Adam, it's not good for you to be alone, as if to say, Adam, by yourself, you will never get all of me. Adam, by yourself, you are too small to draw out all of me. You need a community. And therefore, when it comes to worship, when it comes to corporate worship, truly the more the merrier. Truly the more the merrier. Truly the more people the merrier. Truly the more racially diverse the merrier. That's why the greatest worship that we will ever experience is in heaven. Because in heaven there will be people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. We will finally be able to see God as he truly is. We will finally be able to see all the facets of who he is. Why? Because all of God's people will be together. All of us as God's people, people from every tongue, tribe, and nation will be together drawing out, seeing who God is as he truly is for the first time ever. When God's people come together, we get more of God. When God's people come together, we get more of God, not less, always. So we worship corporately. We gather together to worship God. And based upon Psalm 95, we gather together to worship God with all of our faculties, head, heart, and hands. This is what a typical Austin Stone worship looks like. How would you describe it? Well, you might say we get together and we sing some songs, and then we hear a sermon, and then we sing some more songs, and we go home. Well, at the very basic level, you're about right. But why do we do that? First, we gather together and sing. Why? Because we're preparing our hearts and minds to hear from God's word. There are truths of God that we need to hear, know, and believe. But first we need to soften our hearts and minds so that we can actually hear from God's word. That's why we sing. There's a place in 2 Kings chapter 3 where Elisha, as God's prophet, really needs to hear from the Lord. He really needs to hear from the Lord. And so do you know what he says? In 2 Kings 3.15, Elisha says, now bring me a musician. Now bring me a musician. And then it says that when the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon him. When the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon him. What does this mean? There's never mechanics or a formula when it comes to seeking God. God is not some genie in a bottle that's responding to some music being played. So what's happening? What's happening is that God is responding to Elisha's heart that is seeking him. But in a very real way, music is helping Elisha's heart to seek God. And this is the ultimate purpose for why God created music. God created music. 
so that it could help us seek God and to worship God. Music has this power, right? Music has this power. What's music's power? It can create moods. It can create moods. You could, sit, you could be sitting lazy on the couch and then you hear some music and you're like, man, I need to go work out, right? It could create moods. It could create the mood for you to go out on some date. It could create a mood for you to chill and relax and sleep. It could create all kinds of moods. Zephaniah 317, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. God created music. Music isn't something that man created and then now we're using it to worship God. Music is something God created for the primary purpose of us worshiping him. And then what happens? After we sing, we hear from God's word. This is where our minds are engaged, to know and believe truths about God. Our worship has to be rooted in God's word. Worship without theology is like a cut flower. Worship without theology is like a cut flower. It may seem beautiful for a little while, but it will soon wither away and die. All the nutrients needed for worship comes from God's word. After all, it's impossible to worship God without knowing God, right? How do you worship God if you don't know him? You may gather together and try to worship some God, right? But it's most likely a God of your own making, a God of your own imaginations, if the God that you know doesn't come from the God of the scriptures. The word is God's self-revelation. He is saying, this is me. Not what you imagine me to be, not what you want me to be, not what you think I am. This is me. This is how you get to know me. And so we can't worship God unless we know God. And how do we know God? It comes from God's word. That's the purpose of preaching. And then we sing again. Why? Why all the singing? If you look through the Bible, you'll see that God's people are a singing people. If you look through the Bible, you'll see that God's people are a singing people. And the reason is because as God's people, we are saying there are truths about who God is and what he has done for us in Christ Jesus. That there are realities of heaven and salvation that are too great for mere speaking, but they must be sung. That's what we're saying. These realities are too great for us to just talk about it. We have to sing about it. That's what Christians do. And what we're saying is that there are depths and heights of God's word and intensities and emotions of the heart that will not be satisfactorily expressed by mere speaking and therefore we sing. Therefore we must sing. If there are truths of God that we know, but those truths don't move us to sing, it just means we don't know those truths as we ought to know. That's all that means. We think we know it. Right? But if those do truths don't move us to sing, it means we don't know it as we ought to know it. And so we sing. And then we're done, right? We're done worshiping. And then we go to lunch, right? No, this is the most, this is where most of us miss the fullness of what worship is to be. Remember the end of Psalm 95 where we are called to kneel, to bow down, where there's a commitment expressed, God, today, if you would speak, I will listen. God, today, if you will speak, I will obey. I will not harden my heart. Our hands are supposed to be engaged in worship and produce obedience. When the singing ends, the worship doesn't end. When the singing ends today, make a commitment. When the singing ends today, make a commitment that your worship will not end. Your worship needs to continue outside these doors as you obey what you, have heard, what you have heard God speak from his word. The truth of God not sung is a truth of God not yet known as we ought to know. But a truth of God not obeyed is, not, is a truth of God not yet loved as we ought to love it. If you know God, if you really, really know God, then what? Then you'll love God. If you really see him, if you really know him, then you will love him. But if you really love God, if you really love God, then you'll obey him. Isn't that what Jesus said? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And lastly, why should we worship? 
Why should we worship God in this way? Why should we take the time and energy to gather together, fight all the traffic, come into downtown, go to all those campuses, gather together like this to worship God? Why should we try to worship him with our everything? Very simple. Because Jesus gave us his everything. Why should we worship him with everything? Very simple, because Jesus, God himself, gave us his everything. Jesus gave us his mind. Jesus gave us his mind. Philippians chapter 2 tells us, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, though being in the form of God, did not consider his equality with God as something to be grasped, but he humbled himself. He emptied himself, right, by taking upon the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. What does that mean? This means that Jesus, though he was God, Though he was omniscient and knew everything, he didn't grasp onto that privilege of knowing everything. But instead, he humbled himself and he subjected his mind to learning. Can you believe that? He subjected his mind to learning. Though he was the word of God in the flesh, right? He was God's word in the flesh. He had to spend time in the temple to learn God's word, he read God's word, he memorized God's word, he studied God's word. And so all the incredible things that we know Jesus taught, all the incredible things that Jesus said, why was he able to say those things? Why was he able to teach those things? Because he's just God and he knew everything? No, because he spent the first 30 years of his earthly life studying memorizing, learning. Everything that he ever taught us that gave us life itself is the fruit of Jesus saying, here's my mind. I'm gonna dedicate it to you in learning and studying God's word. Not only that, Jesus gave us his heart. He didn't just coldly teach us from a distance, but we see Jesus bending down to touch a leper that no one else was willing to touch. We see Jesus care about people that are hungry and spends the time feeding them even when his own disciples wanted to send them away. We see a Jesus that defends the prostitute and eats with the tax collector, befriending and loving people that no one else was willing to befriend or love. We see a Jesus who tenderly washes dirty feet. We see Jesus, in Jesus we have a God who sees our brokenness and our sinfulness and who doesn't destroy us in his anger but cries with great compassion. Passion. In Jesus, we have a God who is willing to cry. Can you think about that? In Jesus, we have a God who is willing to cry. Jesus gave us all his heart. Lastly, in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see Jesus giving us his obedience, his hands. In Jesus, we have a Savior who's not just willing to learn some things so that he can teach us. In Jesus, we have a Savior who doesn't just softly and affectionately tell us that he loves us, but he fiercely and violently showed us how much he loved us on the cross. Though he prayed and asked God three times, God, can this cup pass from me? God, is there any other way? God, I've never known what it is to sin. Must I become it? God, I've never known what it is to be without you. God, must I be forsaken? He prayed and he prayed. And though struggling and shaking and sweating drops of blood, he still gave us all of his, all of his obedience as he prays. Nevertheless, Father, not my will, but yours be done. He was obedient, obedient to death, even death on the cross. And so when you have a Jesus like this, when you encounter a Jesus like this, who gave you his everything, there was no holding back. He gave you his everything. And it's Sunday. It's the Lord's day. Where else are we going to go? You got something better to do? Where else are we going to go but to come together and say, oh, come let us worship him, right? Right? What else do you have to give him but to give him your everything? Let's pray together.
Father, we want to worship you with all that we are. Our minds, Lord, we say it's yours. You gave it to us. Father, we look at the ways that we use our minds and we say that many times we use it on foolish things, the things of this world, the things that will soon pass. Father, we say that we want to worship you with all of our minds. Lord, we give our affections to all the things of this world, the pleasures that are fleeting. We give our hearts and our emotions to things that will always fail us, Lord, but you are the one that will never fail us. Father, we say that we make a commitment today that after the singing ends, our worship will not end. That today, because you have spoken, that we will listen, that we will kneel, we will bow down, and we will obey. We thank you for worship. We thank you that you have given it to us for the purpose of changing our life. Not just so that we could have some emotional experience, but that it is something that you gave us to change our very life. To make us look more and more like your son Jesus. We thank you for Jesus that in him you gave us your everything. We ask that you would be worshipped. In Jesus' name we pray.